I just got my hands on a brand new Astro toy and it's a big one. This time it is a full frame color camera. Now I already have a full frame setup and it's honestly my favorite one to use, but that one is a monochrome camera, which of course means filters, a filter wheel and planning. This on the other hand is something completely new to me, a one shot color full frame camera. So no filter swapping, no channel juggling, just pure color straight from the sky. So when this camera showed up, I knew just exactly what I was going to do with it. It is the ASI 4400 MC Pro from ZWO and I've already had it with me for a few weeks. Just enough time to take it out on a few clear nights and see how it performs under real conditions. So today I'll show you what I found, how it performed and where I think it fits in ZWO's lineup. Let's get right into it. My name is Lutza and you're watching The Space Koala. Now this is not ZWO's first full frame color camera, not by far. In fact, they've already had two of them on the market for quite some time now. The first one was the ASI 2400 MC Pro, a camera built around huge 5.94 micron pixels. That one is all about sensitivity. It is the kind of camera that didn't really care about chasing extreme resolution. It just wanted to grab every bit of light it could. You could throw it on a longer focal length telescope without worrying about the seeing that much and it would work just fine. The trade-off of course was resolution with 24 megapixels. It gave you beautiful images but if you were trying to print big or crop into smaller parts you started to feel that limit. Then came the ASI 6200MC, the same full frame size but a completely different beast. It uses Sony's IMX455 sensor, the same one that became famous for its crazy detail and very small 3.76 micron pixels. Suddenly the files were massive and the resolution jumped to over 60 megapixels and the images look razor sharp of course when the telescope and the seeing conditions allow. That also means though that it is more demanding on the optics, more demanding on proper tracking and guiding and let's be honest it comes with a higher price tag. So that was a status quo, one camera optimized for sensitivity and signal and the other for resolution and detail but there wasn't really anything in the middle and that's where the new one comes in, the ASI 4400 MC Pro and it is meant to bridge that gap. It is not just another option for the sake of having more models, it is actually designed to completely replace the older 2400 MC with something more balanced, high resolution, an updated design and newer electronics while keeping the same full frame format. The 4400 MC Pro comes with ZWO's updated design that they have recently introduced on their newer generation of deep sky cameras. The finish is now matte and the port layout has been rearranged and the cooling system has a redesigned heatsink with smaller concave fins. The fan grill now matches the rest of the body and the cross screws have been replaced with smaller hex bolts. It is however still the exact same size and weight as the 2400 and the 6200 so it remains compatible with your existing adapters and spacers and what have you. Inside the camera uses Sony's IMX366 sensor, a full frame back illuminated CMOS chip with 44 megapixels and 4.4 micron pixels. It's part of the same modern generation of sensors as the IMX455 and the IMX410 but it sits right between them in resolution and pixel size. Compared to the IMX410 inside the 2400 camera, this one gives you almost double the number of pixels which means finer details and more flexibility for cropping or pairing with different focal lengths. The 4.4 micron pixels retain a full well capacity of around 75 kilo electrons, helping maintain smooth gradients in bright regions without clipping stars too quickly. It is a 14-bit sensor with over 13 stops of dynamic range, read noise between roughly 1.1 and 7.6 electrons and about 80% peak quantum efficiency. Cooling performance is identical to ZWO's other pro models capable of reaching 35 degrees centigrade below ambient. Another thing that changes, of course, is readout speed, which is a direct consequence of the number of pixels. With 44 megapixels to move around 
and the 512 megabytes of integrated DDR buffer. The 4400 is naturally slower than the older 2400, but still significantly faster than the 6200. It can shoot full frame at up to 8.3 frames per second, roughly four times quicker than the 6200 MC. It's still not something you would use for planetary work, but if you're pairing it with a fast computer, it does make a difference in refresh cycles and live viewing. In the box, you get the usual ZWO setup. The tilt plate comes already installed on the camera, and you'll find a small hex wrench for adjustments included. There's also an M42 to M48 adapter ring, a red USB 3.0 cable, two short USB 2.0 cables, and two spacers that bring the optical train out to the standard 55 millimeters of back focus. What is not included, however, is the power supply. So if you are sticking to a purely ZWO ecosystem, then of course you can power the camera directly from the ASI Air's DC outputs with one of the many included uh, cables. However, especially when it comes to large cameras like this one, each person's rig is a little bit different. Therefore, the power setup may vary and you are expected to sort that part out yourself. ZWO does sell standard 12 volt AC DC adapters separately but in my opinion if you're using an Astro PC or a power box or literally anything else it is generally more convenient to power the camera from there rather than connecting it directly to the mains. During my tests this was the rig I was using I was running the camera at a gain of 136 that is the point at which it switches to high conversion gain mode so that is the point at which it starts prioritizing low readout noise versus dynamic range so that it is a very sensible gain setting to use with this camera for deep sky work. Of course this is the ASI Air but I also tested the camera in Nina on my PC using ZWO's native drivers rather than as an ASCOM camera just to confirm the connection, the cooling and the controls whether everything works normally. I also captured my calibration frames in there since shooting quite literally thousands of short exposures for my master bias is infinitely faster on a proper PC than on the ASI Air. For those shots I of course still used the same gain value of 136 and I have set the offset to 150 to match also my light images taken with the ASI Air. Over several nights I used the 4400 for broadband imaging without any filters. The camera includes a built-in UV IR cut window so you don't need a separate luminance filter when shooting unfiltered broadband. As for the optics, I paired it with my SCAR SQA55 to see how the camera would do on a very wide field, super short focal length telescope. And this is how I could really take advantage of this ginormous sensor. As I already knew that this setup corrected a full frame sensor, even with smaller pixels, I knew that this would operate without any issues. And in fact, it did. Now, before I show you the actual deep sky images I captured during my test, let's take a quick look at the performance of the sensor itself. Here, it clearly looks like there's amplifier glow going on on the sides, but let's look at the numbers to put that into context. The very darkest pixels here have values of 0.0043 and then the brightest parts of the M glow are 0.0044. So this frame is extremely stretched and that is why it looks a bit dramatic. In comparison, this is a dark frame from an older camera with a true M glow problem. These darkest areas are around 0.16 and then the glow reaches almost 0.8. That is a completely different scale. However, there's no denying it. The 4400 does have a bit of M glow. It is so small that it will likely be buried under your signal and your bias. That is why I personally chose not to use these darks in the processing of my frames but it is up to you and don't be alarmed if your darks look like this. As I mentioned before, I also took 2000 bias frames, which is how I like to do my master biases. I like to do them at a very high quality so that I can then reuse them across all of my projects for calibrating both my lights and my flats. 
And when you stack that many, you actually start to see all the subtle fixed patterns across the sensor, exactly what you would expect to see in a well-created bias frame. Nothing surprising here, this is exactly how it should be. So with that out of the way, let's move on to the actual images I took with this camera with this setup. The first one is a very wide shot of the M45 de Pleiades framed slightly off-center to include the surrounding dark molecular clouds. I paid special attention to the small baby eagle nebula, one of my favorite tiny details in that region often overlooked in favor of the brighter parts of the molecular cloud. Then there is this quick exposure that I took of a region within the Milky Way, which I believe is part of the Sagittarius star cloud. This wasn't even planned, I just pointed the telescope there while I was waiting for M45 to climb up higher in the sky, but these are some of my favorite types of images, those super dense galactic windows packed with millions of stars where the sky feels almost unreal and it's just like a carpet of stars all over. Next up, I captured a wide view of the question mark nebula, a massive patch of emission regions that isn't really a single object, but a collection of different regions that just happen to line up in a way from our vantage point to form a giant question mark written across the sky. This was still taken in broadband, by the way, and with a 50% moon. And of course, I couldn't resist pointing it at M31, the Andromeda Galaxy, with the fact that you see so much of the surrounding sky regions, it really gives you an idea of how huge this field of view is. Some of the tests were taken under bright skies with the moon present, while others, including the Pleiades and the Sagittarius star cluster, were captured under much darker moonless conditions. Under moonless skies, the background brightness varied significantly between frames, but the color response remained consistent, and when the moon was down, of course, the field became much cleaner, allowing finer dust and background detail to emerge, particularly in the dense molecular clouds of Taurus. For bright targets such as the Pleiades, I captured exposures of different lengths and combined them to prevent the saturation of the brightest stars while still preserving the faint reflection nebulosity around them. This is good practice regardless of how good the dynamic range of your camera might be because realistically you are always going to saturate some of those star cores, but this is how I was able to get a final image in which you have a mostly smooth transition from the bright stellar cores to the super faint outer reflection clouds. So the 4400 MC Pro is launching at 3000 US dollars, 29.99, which puts it at the exact same price as the older 2400 MC Pro. It's meant to replace, and then the 6200 MT Pro by comparison remains at a higher price at $39.99. ZW's goal with this camera was probably to modernize the 2400 rather than extend the product range. Full disclosure, ZW did give me the opportunity to purchase this camera, and I did, so this is actually now mine and not just a test unit. I've been using it for several sessions, and it is very nice to have a color full-frame camera in my arsenal. Overall, everything worked as expected. The only minor issue I ran into was dew. By default, I usually don't turn on the built-in dew heater, which this camera also has. There's no particular reason, I guess it's just a habit, and on a few humid nights I started noticing a bit of condensation showing up on the images, so I immediately turned the heater on and that fixed it completely. For reference, at the same time I was also running a completely different setup, that one right there, with my 6200mm camera, and it showed the same condensation signs at the same time, so it has nothing to do with the camera and everything to do with the actual weather conditions. I guess that's my lesson learned, that I will probably just start enabling the heater by default from now on. Another thing is while I was using this telescope for my tests, I'm actually thinking of building a much wider rig using this camera. Once that's ready and functional and I get some images, I'm sure that I will also be sharing um, that on here as well. So I hope you enjoyed the images and this little walkthrough. You'll find all the specs and retailer links in the description. And thank you very much for watching and as usual, I wish you clear skies.